So uh, these are very common hematologic disorders with a very high um, cost of care as well as burden of disease to the patients. Uh, there are limited options for treatment and specifically for curative treatments. Uh, the only curative treatment that's currently approved outside of genetic therapies, most of which are in um, clinical trials is uh, stem cell transplantation and that is available since these are genetic disorders, uh, uh, it, those treatments are available to a minority of patients, less than 15%, for instance, of sickle cell patients will have a matched sibling donor um, that doesn't have the disease since it's genetic. And that's why it's very important that these patients have access to newer therapies that can be accessed by many, many patients. So I would say that this is a very, very exciting time in terms of the genetic therapies. Um, three decades ago when I first uh, decided I would uh, focus my academic interests on beta hemoglobinopathies. We were talking about gene therapies being a reality in five years, and then we were talking about it every five years like it was going to happen, and it didn't happen. And the big problem is that the, the gene that's abnormal, the beta globin gene, is very, very large, and that plagued scientists because they were not able to get it in and be expressed at the right levels. It was challenging technically. And just in the last five years, we've seen tremendous improvements. We've seen that this gene can um, be expressed through a lentiviral vector. It gets into the right place. It's expressed at the right level. And that these patients are actually on clinical trials doing extremely well. And um, it, it gives me great hope, and um, I think that this uh, provides great promise for our patients. You know, this is not a, a therapy that uh, is inexpensive and quick. It's a commitment on the part of the patient. It is also extremely expensive. And so this is not therapy that's a pill that can be taken by, for instance, children in Africa where the largest burden of sickle cell disease is. So it'll be, again, at least initially available to fewer patients and in high resource settings. But I think that um, this opens the window to these types of therapies and this is how we will continue to advance and uh, finally provide those types of therapies to a wider group of patients at, um, at a lower cost. One of the biggest problems with the current strategies is it requires what's called an autologous bone marrow or stem cell transplantation approach where the patient's stem cells are actually harvested and modified, but then the patient has to receive chemotherapy to wipe out their bone marrow before these modified stem cells can be given back to the patient. And um, that's not trivial therapy. For one, it results in infertility. And so those types of very toxic um, preparative regimens um, can be a, a huge problem, especially as these patients are facing these very difficult decisions about whether to opt for this therapy or not. And I think that um, researchers are well aware of the urgent need to develop different ways of preparing the patient's bone marrow to receive the modified stem cells back. And there's some very exciting research that's ongoing. And um, just in the, in the last, even just at, at this meeting, we've heard about so many wonderful advances. It gives me great hope. I think that we're finally in an era where we're going to continue to move forward and at a very fast pace. I think in the next five, 10 years, we'll see better and better approaches to, to delivering this type of care with less toxicity.
So uh, I think that, again, uh, that's something that scientists are well aware of. And I think, um, for instance, um, at least in the U.S., um, the NHLBI is partnering with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, this is one example, and they're very focused on uh, funding research that will allow this therapy to be delivered more easily without the high cost. And uh, one change that might be required to accomplish that is what's called in vivo gene therapy, where maybe the gene therapy can be given as a single shot and it, the, um, you know, and it just uh, corrects the um, abnormal gene without requiring the stem cell transplantation. And uh, given the just the initial reports with CRISPR-Cas9 and other viral vectors that uh, does not seem to be uh, outside the realm of possibility, but again, uh, that's something we will have to wait and see. But even having the high cost therapy in the high resource settings is a huge step forward. Uh, when we talk to our patients, um, they tell us, I know that as doctors and scientists, you want everything to be perfect before you move forward, but we want the treatments that are possible now. And I think that um, the shared decision-making that goes into um, actually preparing a patient for this type of uh, therapy is, uh, is going to be very important at this stage.